In this video, I will be sharing with you how I have built my red Komodo specifically for wildlife filmmaking in remote locations. By making this camera as compact as possible, but still powerful enough to film in almost every wildlife related situation. This allows me to film the tiniest insects with a macro lens and to film wildlife far away with a super telephoto lens. I spent a great deal of time and effort selecting every single piece of gear. I even went as far as to email various companies directly like Red Digital and Siray to make sure that my questions were answered before purchasing this camera and the gear. My goal of this video is to hopefully help you decide which lenses and accessories to buy for your Red Komodo if you are looking at filming documentaries, especially wildlife documentaries. Full disclaimer, all of the gear in this video I purchased myself out of my own money and none of these companies have paid me to talk about these products. There are, however, Amazon affiliate links below this video, which you are welcome to use if you choose to buy any of the gear mentioned in this video, for which I do earn a small commission. Okay, back to the video. So obviously the first piece of film gear that we are going to be talking about is the red Komodo itself. Not much needs to be said about this, but I will tell you which cage and battery plate I decided to go for. I'm a big fan of the small rig cages and their 3209 professional kit for Red Komodo is well worth it. I don't know how it's possible but for only $119 you get this camera cage, a wooden NATO side handle and a NATO monitor mount. It's a really awesome deal and it fits the Red Komodo perfectly giving you many options to build it up. For the rail system I got the small rig 1798 tripod mounting base plate and two 12 inch small rig 851 15 mm carbon fiber rods. These rails are strong and help provide support for my lenses if need be. I was also worried about what airport security might think if I took steel rods on the plane and the carbon fiber counterparts don't look nearly as menacing. I also got a lens support clamp from small rig which I have linked in the description below. For the battery plate, I decided to go for the Tilter Dual Canon BP2V mount adapter battery plate. This adapter is made specifically for the Red Komodo and allows you to fit V mount batteries directly onto the back of the camera. It attaches to the Dual Canon BP battery mount on the Red Komodo and features two DTAP ports, two pin ports and one USB port. For only $139 at the time of making this video, it's well worth it as it allows you to use larger V-mount batteries which really changes the entire look and functionality of the Red Komodo. This allows me to power my Red Komodo, my 7-inch port keys monitor and any other camera accessory that requires power and my first AC's iPhone when the battery is low of course. One of my concerns that I had when buying the RED Komodo was that RED cameras are notoriously known for consuming high amounts of power and require big batteries. The RED Komodo is quite the opposite of that and is an extremely efficient cinema camera with very reasonable runtime between battery charges. Either way, I wanted to play it safe, especially when I spend most of my time in the field waiting for animals to do something or specific behavior. Sitting for hours waiting behind the camera, rolling it, can eat through quite a few batteries. Ah, oh, thank you. Ah, oh, I missed a shot. Thank goodness for pre-record. So I decided to go for four Indie Pro Tools Micro Series 98 watt hour V-mount lithium ion batteries. At first I was going to go for only two of these and then two BP batteries so that I could make a smaller camera rig if necessary. But I'm so glad that I decided to buy four of these and just keep it simple. This allows me to use the same battery for my red Komodo and for my port key 7 inch monitor. This way I only need to carry around four of these V-mount batteries and battery swaps are quick and simple. Filming wildlife documentaries can be seriously fast paced at times and I don't want to have to monitor two or three batteries that could potentially die right in the middle of a kill or some exciting animal behavior. Running everything off one Indie Pro Tools V-mount battery means that I only have to worry about one battery. I've heard a lot of good things about these Indie Pro Tools Micro Series V-mount batteries so 
it made sense to invest in a battery that I can rely on. So far, I found that these batteries are very predictable and they hold their charge extremely well. Even in the freezing cold of the Andean mountains or in the boiling heat of the Saudi Arabian desert, where we were filming at 42 to 43 degrees centigrade every day with these batteries and they didn't overheat or malfunction or drop charge or do any funny business like you might expect from smaller internal batteries. So I can highly recommend these for the Red Komodo. They fit the Red Komodo perfectly and make it very easy to film handheld and make the camera very well balanced. They support up to 12 amps of continuous draw and have a 5 bar LED gauge on the side. They also have a DTAP input and output and a USB type A accessory output. Each battery has a capacity of 6800 milliamp hours or 98 watt hours. And the output voltage is 14.8 VCD and they weigh round about 1.6 pounds or 730 grams. There are so many V-mount batteries on the market, but I've had bad experiences with buying cheaper batteries and power banks over the years. So I decided to get these batteries specifically because in my opinion, they're the industry standard. I wouldn't go for anything cheaper and you do get ones that are more expensive, but this seems to be the medium ground. And they are made in the US, which gives me a lot of confidence that if something goes wrong and I need to send them back, I can do so. They do have another model, which is slightly more expensive, which does have an LCD screen on each of the batteries, which allows you to monitor the charge of each battery, which is probably worth it now that I think about it. The Micro Series V-mount batteries are round about $227 at the time of making this video. I find that the Red Komodo hardly uses much battery while it is simply turned on and waiting to roll, but it does consume a bit more when you are rolling. Even so, four of these batteries is more than enough to get through an entire day of filming. Having V-mount batteries allowed me to opt for a slightly larger 7-inch monitor instead of getting a smaller 5-inch monitor like most people would opt for. Although I would really like to try out the Portkey's BM5WR 5.5-inch monitor which is red approved, I opted for Portkey's larger 7-inch monitor. It isn't a touchscreen monitor like the other monitor but it's perfect for checking your exposure when filming in bright sunlight. When filming in the desert of Saudi Arabia, the sand reflected the sunlight off the ground and made it extremely difficult to see anything. But even in the bright desert sunlight, I found it possible to see everything that I was filming and keep everything in order. The Portkey's HS7T2 is a 1920x1200 pixel monitor, which makes it very accurate for pulling focus and accepts both SDI and HDMI signals. It features a rugged metal housing, which really impressed me. And it's great to finally have a monitor that's not flimsy. It's definitely built to take a beating and it also supports 3D LUTs, which I don't need because the Red Komodo has it built in, but it's a really great feature to have. It comes with a DTAP to four pin Limo power cable, which plugs straight into the DTAP port on the tilter battery plate. And you also have the option to directly snap on a wireless video transmitter if you need to. I also bought a Pro-Am LCD video monitor hood for this monitor, but it was so hot in Saudi Arabia that the glue on the Velcro of the monitor hood actually melted off. I'm not sure if it's because of the place that it sticks to on the Pro-Key's monitor is made of glass, and that might make it difficult for the Velcro to stick. And most other monitors are plastic on the edges, but nevertheless, I had to do without it. I think I'm just going to put wider strips of Velcro on the screen because the ones that the Pro-Am monitor hood came with were very thin. I'm sure if I just clean the monitor and reapply the thicker Velcro strips to it that it won't cause any further issues. It's a really well made monitor hood so I'm looking forward to using it on my next shoot. To mount the monitor securely to the small rig camera cage I decided to stick with the small rig brand as I really like this brand and I'm familiar with it. The small rig 2165 top handle is what I opted for as it's a perfect little handle and feels solid and fits securely to the camera cage without any flex. Even when I'm carrying around the entire weight of this camera with a telephoto lens, battery, monitor and everything else, this little handle doesn't show any signs of stress. It's super strong and it fits directly onto the area locating hole on the top of the small rig cage. It can be tightened to the cage with an allen key or an allen wrench and this can be neatly packed into the top handle. 
To securely attach the Porky 7 inch monitor to the small rig top handle, I'm using the small rig NATO rail clamp, which clamps directly to the small rig NATO rail, which is fastened securely to the small rig top handle with an Ari style mounting screw. There are a lot of cables on Amazon that claim to be 12G SDI cables, but when you read the reviews, there are a lot of unhappy customers and the cables turn out to only be 4G SDI cables. It really makes no sense to pay so much for a camera setup and then to skimp on the small accessories. I really hate it when people do this. It's like buying a brand new Ferrari and then going and putting a cheap set of tires on it. It makes absolutely no sense to me. Anyway, I bought the Shape 12G SDI cable with right angle connectors and I'm really happy that I did. I don't know if I would be able to connect the cable to the camera without the right angle cable connectors. The Shape cable is a solid cable and with all the drama about SDI cables and SDI protocol, it just made sense to go with a good quality cable as I know that it would last and not cause me any issues. I also think that 24 inches for a cable is the right length for this camera. They have a cable that's slightly too short and that could put strain on either of the SDI ports. For media capture, I decided to sail into uncharted waters and I went for quite a scary and largely untested option. I bought the Zeta CC Tech CFast to SSD adapter for around about $126 and the Western Digital 2TB internal SSD. I've heard many mixed reviews about this Zite CC Tech CFast to SSD adapter, so I'm not sure if I can recommend this option for everyone. And if I knew that I wasn't recording so much footage like I do when I'm out filming in the bush, I would go for a red approved CFast memory card. With that being said, I'm so far really happy with the ZT adapter and I've had absolutely no issues writing files to cards or dumping the footage afterwards. I format the card in the camera just like I would any CFast memory card and it works perfectly. The only thing is that I can't see how much space I have left on the card but I haven't ever recorded more than one TB of footage onto the card yet in one day. So it might be overkill to have two of these Western Digital 2TB drives, but I didn't know how much space I would need before I bought this camera. And I would rather have more memory than less memory just to be safe. This way I also have a backup just in case the first SSD becomes corrupt or the ZTA adapter breaks or loses connection for some strange reason during the middle of a shoot. When it comes to lenses, I really don't want to have to carry around five different lenses as most of my work is outdoors and I hate carrying lenses around in my backpack that I might use or might not use that day. I was originally going to get the Sigma Art 18-35 f1.8 lens for Canon EF as this is a very popular choice and it would work really well with the Red Komodo. But then I heard about the Surrey Jupiter 35. The Sire Jupiter 35mm T2 full frame macro cine lens for EF works perfectly with the RED Komodo as the RED Komodo comes with an EF to RF adapter. This allows you to use EF lenses like the Sire Jupiter 35 and this is a very capable macro lens as well. There are so many instances when I'm filming wildlife in the bush and I suddenly come across a small animal like a scorpion or a snake and I want to get as close as possible to film it but then I have to get out my macro lens which takes more time and by the time I get to it the snake or the scorpion is already gone. For the kind of wildlife filmmaking work that I do this lens was a no-brainer but at the time it wasn't available yet so I phoned Siri directly and I asked them whether or not I would be able to buy this lens in time. They assured me that it would arrive in the USA before I was to leave for Saudi Arabia. So I quickly bought it that evening on Indiegogo and they emailed me back to tell me that it was on the way and it just took a few days to get to the US and there were no hiccups. Luckily it arrived in the nick of time and I was able to take it with me on my next film trip. When you hold this lens in your hand it feels really solid and robust. This is a full frame lens so if I would like to use it with other cameras such as the Sony FX3 or the FX6 it means that I'm also able to do this. I could also use this camera on the Red Komodo with the Viltrox or the Metabone Speed Booster and this would increase the lens aperture by one stop of light. 
So I think I will be getting one of these in the near future, but this lens is also awesome to use as it is and gives a somewhat soft look to my footage. As a macro lens, this lens works extremely well with the RED Komodo and this is where I found myself using it the most. It's a reasonably wide lens which allows me to be able to get a lot of sharp macro shots of wildlife and still show the environment and surroundings in the background, which gives context to the shot. The focus ring rotates around 200 degrees and both the focus ring and the iris ring are smooth and easy to use. I really like the feel of them and I find focusing and setting up my exposure a breeze. So we finally get to the Canon RF 100-500mm f4.5-7.1 to L IS USM telephoto lens, which when paired with the RED Komodo morphs this little body of a cinema camera into an absolute monster for wildlife filmmaking. This lens is actually quite small and weighs only 3 pounds or 1,365 grams, which is quite light considering its reach and that it also has image stabilization. It is able to focus on subjects very close when it's at 100 millimeters and it can quickly zoom in all the way to 500 millimeters, which makes this lens probably the best wildlife filmmaking lens that I've ever used. I have all the range that I need in one single lens and I can even get some quality macro shots as it has a minimum focal distance of 90 centimeters. One of the main reasons why I bought this lens was that it has image stabilization, which I feel is necessary when filming at the end of this lens. It also allows me to film handheld at 100 millimeters, which is very useful for run and gun wildlife filmmaking. Another great feature of this lens is that it has autofocus, which to be honest, I haven't even tried out yet, but I would like to test it out on one day by filming wildlife with it on, and then the next day by turning it off to see in a real life wildlife filmmaking situation, whether or not having it on or off with the RED Komodo would create more consistent results. But for now, I've set it to manual focus, which I have found to be very easy to use. For a variable ND filter, I got the K&F Concept 82mm variable ND filter, as I had seen and read many good things about this variable ND filter, and it's honestly excellent quality for its price point. It allows me to decrease the light hitting the lens by 1 to 5 stops and I didn't find that it had any nasty lens flares or reflections and it doesn't have strong vignetting like other variable ND filters. It seems to be a very good quality variable ND filter so I'm definitely going to buy another one of these for my Sire Jupiter 35mm lens as well. For sound I was going to buy an XLR microphone like the Deity S Mic 2 or the Sennheiser MKE 600 shotgun microphone but the more that I thought about it, the whole idea of this camera rig was to create a powerful and capable camera without it being too bulky. I was also going to get the sound devices Mix Pre 3 2 and sync everything with a Tentacle Sync E. I may go this route in the future, but for now I went for a much cheaper and lighter option, which is the Deity VMic D3 Pro. This tiny microphone fits onto my small rig handle, although it is a bit tight and it does touch the port key 7 inch monitor. So I will definitely try to find a magic arm or a bracket to separate them so that it doesn't touch the monitor. Luckily because of the thick dead cat that was included with it, it doesn't cause any noise or interference when it's touching the monitor. The Rycode Lie shock mount can be adjusted back and forth to make sure that it's out of shot when using wider lenses. I'm actually quite impressed with this microphone and it's adequate for most of the wildlife filmmaking that I do. It allows me to record audio for wildlife videos like bird behavior and scenes when animals make sounds that are spontaneous and unexpected. I'm able to charge this microphone with a USB-C cable which is so practical and every time I get back from the end of the day I just place the camera on the charging station and plug it in and charge it. It has a 51 hour battery life so I just keep it on the whole day when I'm filming. I'm not too sure how long it takes to charge but I find that it takes more or less one hour for the light to turn green and then it's ready to film again. This has made recording audio with this camera very simple for me. It also has a stepless gain knob which allows you to adjust the amount of gain without having to go into the camera or do anything complicated. It's simple to use and that's what I really like about it. 
So to wrap things up, I hope that this video helps you to decide which lenses or accessories would work well for you. And you might want to rig up your red Komodo in a similar way if you are using it for documentary filmmaking, especially wildlife documentary filmmaking. This red Komodo rig is perfectly suited for my wildlife filmmaking needs but I would encourage you to choose the gear that suits you best. I put up on the screen the total cost of this entire rig so that you can see how much it costs and you can see that this red Komodo is hardly a $6,000 camera which is what I tried to convince myself when I was buying it. So even though I had to spend a lot more money, I'm really happy that I was able to buy a powerful camera for the work that I do. And I wouldn't be able to build a camera with the specs that this camera has at the price that it has just a few years ago. So let me know in the comments what you think of this Red Komodo wildlife filmmaking rig and it would be awesome to hear your feedback and to hear which lenses or accessories you are deciding to go for or have already bought for your Red Komodo. If you haven't already given this video a like then give it a like, subscribe to my YouTube channel for more wildlife documentary filmmaking videos and I will see you in the next video.